Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our online workshop. Now, for those who don't know me, my name is Adrian Paul, and I am a partner at the Heritage Partnership, a partner practice of St. James's Place. Manage the unpredictable is the theme for today's session, and in the next one hour, we will take you through key areas that you need to know about wills and guardianship that will help you prepare you and your family in the event of unforeseen circumstances. Now, we're very appreciative and grateful to have Marcus Hinckley and Radhika Mariappan here with us today. Now, Marcus is the head of Hawksford Trust Singapore, a regulated trust company and part of a 60-year-old international trust company with offices in Singapore and seven other countries in Asia and Europe. Now, their headquarters are in Jersey in the Channel Islands, and Hawksford has been assisting St. James's Place clients for the last 10 years with related estate planning services, the drafting of wills, acting as executors, and a trustee. We also have Radhika, who is the managing director of Fidelis Law Corporation. Her core specialty areas of practice are civil and commercial litigation involving contractual claims, everything from construction law to employment law, company law, and also probate. Now we've got, uh, we're, we're trying to make the session as interactive as possible today. So as you can see in front of you today, that's the agenda. Now at any time during this session, please feel free to type out questions within the, quest, um, within the chat box. And of course, during the Q&A itself, we will be allowing for you to raise your hands and you will be unmuted if you do wish to ask a question using voice. Now, just before we kick off, we're just going to do a short poll. Now, what is the main reason that you have not yet prepared a will? Let's just give it a few minutes to make sure everyone has a chance to answer. Okay, we've got quite a few votes in, so if we can close the poll now. Okay, so we've got about 70% of us here today who are unsure where to start. So let's hope that this will at least give you a little bit of a heading as to where you need to go. And let's kick it straight off. Marcus, why exactly do I need a will? And why is this so important? Adrian, thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, the death of a close loved one is enormously challenging, uh, and leaving your affairs in disarray make that challenge even harder, uh, especially for those who might live outside their home country. Uh, failing to have a will or pre-planned guardianship arrangements for your children can have significant negative consequences for your family. On the other hand, leaving a settled, clear legacy is an important and meaningful gift for your loved ones. So simply put, the reasons why you should consider a will really boils down to solving three main problems. I've got them up there on the screen. First one, uncertainty and conflict. So there's no question that if you don't have a will, that the, the possibility for conflict arises significantly, particularly because um, you or your loved ones ha may have un unintended and unexpected consequences and assets may end up going where you never intended them to go. And I'm sure Radhika will, will, Radhika will talk about that later um, on what's the effect of not having a will and intestacy. The next, the next problem is costs and difficulties of intestacy. So again, I touched on that just a moment ago. Um, the, the, the difficulties of intestacy are, um, are that you haven't planned properly, you haven't got a will in place, there's nothing in writing about what you wanted to happen, and therefore the law in the relevant country, and that country may not necessarily be just one country, um, particularly if you are an expat living in Singapore, 
Um, and then finally, the difficulty to locate your assets. So you can imagine, particularly again for expats, if you're living in your, a, the country which is not your home country, how well does your family, extended family, know what you have um, and where it's situated? How difficult is it going to be for them to find your assets? Um, and we can extend to that these days with digital assets and cryptocurrency and that kind of thing. Um, next slide, Adrian. So the question, should I have a will? It's a reasonable question to ask. There's certain trigger uh, um, factors that you should take into account. Not everyone is, is right for a will. So you have to consider, am I the type of candidate that would need one? So I've put up on the screen various things which might, be, might consider sort of trigger um, to whether you should have a will or not. Things such as, do you have a bank account? So um, if you don't have a bank, rather, if you don't have a bank account, it would be very strange. So most people will have a bank account. It doesn't have to have a significant amount of money in it to for you to to want to transfer that to who you who you see fit. Um, uh, have you recently been married or divorced? You may have had a will, but uh, um, marriage will um, uh, void the previous will you have, and you need to prepare a new one. Do you want to leave money in, in, in unusual ways? Do you want to leave some to charity? Do you want to leave some in different proportions to people? Um, it's important that you have that choice and you can have that choice via a will. Uh, do you have children? But even if you don't have any money at all, it's very important uh, to ensure that your children are adequately dealt with, catered for by um, appropriate custody arrangements. And those custody and guardianship arrangements, can your, your wishes can be set out in your will. And indeed, it, it's very important to do that because if you don't, uh, say both spouses will die, leaving your children behind, who will take over the guardianship of your children? Uh, particularly if you haven't indicated what your preference is. Um, and then finally, I mean, there's others, but do you have a complicated estate? So, you know, do you have assets in different countries that need to be dealt with? Um, do you have um, split ownership of some uh, assets? When you die, do you want assets to be distributed in a particular way? I could go on, but that's a, that's, that's a, a, a good start of the triggers that you would need. Thank you, thank you for that, Marcus. Um, next one for Radhika. So what are the requirements for a valid will? Thank you, Adrian. Good evening, everyone. So basically, the requirements for a valid will are set out in the Wills Act. There are five main requirements. Firstly, that the will has to be in writing. The testator, meaning the person signing the will, the person making the will, has to be at least 21 years old. The testator also has to sign at the foot of the will. He must have he or she must have two witnesses signing uh, in the presence of the testator, confirming that they witnessed the testator signing the will before them. And these two witnesses cannot be beneficiaries under the will. They can they cannot be the spouses of any of those beneficiaries under the will. So these are the main requirements under the Wills Act. Okay, and what exactly would happen, Radhika, in the event of someone passing away without a will? Okay. Um. Marcus has touched on this earlier, you know, um, being able to have the autonomy to decide what assets go to whom. So if you don't prepare a will and you pass away, then your assets will all be distributed according to the Singapore laws of intestacy. What this means is you basically have no say in who gets what. The law, the Intestate Succession Act, sets out the list of beneficiaries who will uh, stand to gain. Uh, from your estate upon your passing. So there's a slide here that shows who, how the manner of distribution is dictated by the Interstate Succession Act um, in these scenarios where you have surviving beneficiaries, only spouse, only parents, spouse and children, etc. So this, these rules are fixed. You don't get to uh, get out of them unless you draw up a will. And okay. also, um, I should also point out that um, when you go through these, uh, the intestacy process, it is more time consuming and it may also cost more generally because there is more paperwork involved. 
when someone dies without a will in place. And um, essentially what this means is someone from the family is going to have to apply to the court to take over administration of the deceased est uh, estate. Yes. That was actually going to be my next question. So what are the different processes involved if someone passes away with a will and without a will? Okay, now we'll start off with what happens if someone passes away with a will. Um, then the procedure is called the uh, obtaining the grant of probate. So in a grant of probate application, you already have a will in place. It's a lot more straightforward. The starting, the first step is really to go and see a lawyer and the lawyer will advise you on what sort of documents are required. Uh, typically, this will include the death, death certificate uh, and identification documents of the deceased. So your lawyer will advise you on what sort of documents are needed. This is usually done uh, by the executor. So meaning to say that in the will, the testator will normally uh, name someone uh, so and so to be my executor. And this is the process that the executor has to go through. So the first step is there. And uh, the next step will be to file the application in court. So the application for grant of probate, there's four documents listed on the slide, uh, which will need to be filed upon uh, making this application to court. Um, within a week or so, sometimes, uh, most, most times within a week or so, the court will approve the application in part. It will accept the application and issue you a document with the court seal on it. So once you obtain this ex parte originating summons with the seal, you can then write to the banks, any financial institutions to confirm with them whether the deceased had any um, uh, bank accounts or insurance policies, etc. with these institutions. Uh, you will need to do this after your application has been accepted and you have that document with the court seal on it. Otherwise, the financial institutions, they won't uh, attend to your inquiries. And there, thereafter, once you have a full and complete picture of what assets the deceased had, you will need to prepare the supporting documents, the administration oath, the supporting affidavit, and the schedule of assets. This document is supposed to include all those assets that you have discovered belong to the testator. Once you file these documents, the court will look at it. If everything appears to be in order, the next step is really to extract the grant of probate. The whole process can take uh, can be completed in two months or so if you know what assets the testator has. Otherwise, it will take a, a little bit longer because you've got to write to the banks and wait for them to get back to you. So that is for the grant of probate. Um, there's also another scenario in which a will has been drawn up by the testator, but for some reason, there's a failure of executor. For example, if he names someone, his brother, as an executor and the brother does not want to act. So the brother will state that I'm giving up this right to be the executor. And in that situation, what we will have is a, not really a grant of probate anymore. It will be a grant of letters of administration with will annexed. So the will still applies. It is just that for some reason, uh, it cannot be complied with in full because the executive refuses to act. And it is still more straightforward than a situation where the person dies intestate and you have to go through the letters of administration process. So there's three, grant of probate, Grant of, grant of letters of administration with will annexed, and finally, just the letters of administration. So for this, when someone passes away without a will, as we've mentioned earlier, a family member will have to take up the responsibility of being the administrator, has to be over 21 years old, of sound mind, and they are, they are so-called uh, volunteering to be the administrator must be, appoint, must be approved by the court. So there's a lot of different uh, procedures, requirements under the Interstate Succession Act that make it very, very complicated. So to get around all this, it's always best to just do a will. Thank you, Radhika. And Marcus, if you could just weigh in with what particular issues could potentially arise for an expat living in Singapore? Mm, yeah, sure, Adrian. Um, so, I mean, really the, the um, a lot of the clients that I deal with are expats living in Singapore. They have assets in Singapore where they've, where they've built over a period of time, but they often have assets outside. Um, they, they, might have had, they might have a young, uh, young family here, but you know, if, if they were to lose their EP, for example, their children, their spouse might be on dependent pass, and within 30 days, 
they have to get out of Singapore. So things have to be well planned. Your extended family uh, can't easily administer your worldwide estate because they don't know what's going on. They don't know the rules of Singapore. Um, and for them, it's a very stressful time anyway because they've just, just, just lost a, a loved one, one of their family members. So really having a will is about having a roadmap for who you're leaving behind, someone local that they can turn to. Um, indeed, if, if you die leaving your spouse and they're living in Singapore still, they, they will be uh, stressed, clearly they'll be in a period of mourning, but also they probably won't know the laws of Singapore either. And so we'll, we'll need to have something um, quite more significant than, than simply just to leave it to the, leave it to the law of the land. Um, your executors probably won't know what you own. If you if you were to die if you were to die leaving a spouse, okay, your your spouse may well be well aware of it. But if you die together, um, then you know it would be very difficult for your uh, executors if they were in England, for example, having to come out to Singapore. Um, I had a, a a good friend of mine when I was I was 32 years old and he was 30 and he had moved to Hong Kong. I was still living in New Zealand at the time, and, um, and he died um, uh, at this young age. But even though, even though he was young, he, he had bought a property in Hong Kong. And I um, was asked by his parents to help in the probate process. And you know, I, I, I was, a, I was a, a fresh lawyer at the time in New Zealand. I hadn't seen the world as it were, and I found it really difficult and complicated um, and expensive to deal with this um, probate situation in a foreign country. And my friend did not have a will. And if he had had one, it would have made it a lot easier. So a roadmap is probably the first, the first thing. Um, two more points I would make. The second one is, as I mentioned before, children. Very important to um, ensure that the guardianship of your children, particularly now that you're in the realm of potentially cross-border custodianship issues, um, uh, that, that you deal with that. And a very effective way to deal with that is in your will, in a very simple way. You want to keep this out of the courts. You want to take control of who will come and collect your, your son or daughter and take custody of them. And you want to give those people a lawful basis for, for taking the children out of Singapore and taking them into a foreign country. Um, and then probably the final one is uh, tax issues. So if you've got assets, well, not the final one, actually, there's one more, but tax issues. If you've got, uh, if you're the domiciled in, in the UK, for example, you'll, you'll be subject to uh, worldwide IHT, um, and potentially you'll be subject to that at higher levels if you, if you can't take advantage of some of the exemptions that exist, creating a will is the best way to get those exemptions. Um, uh, and then um, uh, I think, uh, well, actually, no, that, that, that'll do for now. I'll, I'll, I'll ask some further questions later. Okay, because I've, I've got to come back and touch on this a little bit as well, Marcus, after this. But mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I'll leave it for now. I want to radical, just to explain to us the legal aspects to consider when drawing up wills in different jurisdictions. Now, we've had a question come in from the audience, and it's essentially if I have a will in my home country, but have assets in Singapore and or other countries. Do I need additional wills to cover those assets? I mean, if you could just please weigh in here, Radhika. Yeah, okay. Um, essentially, if that exists, I mean, to answer the question uh, from Adam, to answer the question, it all depends on whether this first will that you've drawn up in your home country, is it expressed to cover all assets that you own? So if it is expressed to cover all assets that you own, then at first blush, yes, it includes your assets in Singapore and other countries. However, um, wherever the wherever your home country is, however that will is prepared, it may be it will be subject to the laws of Singapore when the assets are being uh, taken out from Singapore. Upon you know after getting probate and then you go through the next process, which is resealing in court, you will need to ensure that that asset that you want to distribute, for example, if it's an immovable property, let's say it's a landed property, uh, and you want to transfer that, there are restrictions on the ownership of landed property in Singapore. So you've got to make sure if there are things that are not, if it's covered by this, that will in your home country, then that's, that's fine. But usually what we would advise clients to do is if you have substantial assets in Singapore, it's always best 
to see a lawyer or see a will writing service and ask them to do up a will that is specifically for your Singapore assets. But of course, that will require you to also make the necessary amendments to that will in your home country to state that it does not cover your Singapore assets. So there's no uh, overlap or there's no inconsistencies because if there is an inconsistency, then sometimes both, both wills may be rendered invalid. So you want to look out for that. Okay, thank you. And Marcus, so earlier we mentioned and we spoke about guardianship. Um, how can I provide for my minor children in a will? So is it yes. as much so, stating fully um, that you, I want them to be raised in such a way? Um, mm, so so um, a lot of the wills that I prepare, are, um, they, they, we, we spend a lot of time with the clients discussing what they want to have for their minor children. So, so um, the most simple form of will is, an, is what we, you would say is an absolute gift. So you 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 know, um, on my death I give to my spouse you know absolutely 100% goes off to to the estate goes to the spouse, but a lot of the times there's 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 minor children involved and so what you may say is you know in the first instance I want to give all my assets to my to my spouse and of course you trust your spouse to look after your kids, um, but if both of you should die together then. I want the trustees to, and you could say, I either give the assets to the children, but a lot of the time, you know, we, it's not necessarily a good idea to give young children, um, or even early, you know, they've just turned turned 25 or well, 20 or something, um, to give them a large amount of money. So what you may consider instead is to set up what's called a testamentary trust, which is contained within the will. So you may say something like, um, in the first place, I give 100% to my to my wife. Um, if we both should die together, um, then I give equally to my three children um, upon them a reaching the ages of. And you might say, you know, maybe they receive 30% of it or 20% of it when they're 20. They might receive another 20% when they're 25. And then maybe they should receive the balance when they're 30 or something like that. So you set up a, a, a trust and then connected to that, often outside the terms of the will, you might write a letter of wishes, which is a bit more ambulatory, talking about um, what kind of uh, schooling you'd like them to have, what kind of um, upbringing you'd like them to have, the sort of the, the, the standard of living you would like them to have. Um, and you might also talk about the the type of investing that you that you want the trustees to um, to, to 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 manage in in relation to the to the estate during that time, but of course you also want to provide for the fact that the guardians of your children, if they are minors, will need access to this money during during their their period of being a minor. Um, so all of those are sort of issues that that you should deal with. Okay, and right and, and nine nine times out of ten, I'll see some sort of a trust set up for minor children. Very rare would would I see, you know, a, the, the the parents just wanting to give their, you know, 15 year old the, the estate. Okay, and Radhika, is there any legal aspects that should be taken note of in terms of like guardianship of children? <clears throat> okay, um, so for guardianship, it basically affects children under 21. And um, there are two kinds of guardians under the guardianship of Infants Act. One is natural guardian. The other one is testamentary guardian. So testamentary guardian is the one that we are uh, concerned with today because that is a guardian that you appoint for your child in the event of your passing. Uh, and it's done by will. So that is allowed. What that means is, I mean, as a parent, either your mother or the father, you get to pick your own uh, guard, guardian for your children in the event of your death. So if your spouse survives you and you want to uh, appoint a testamentary guardian, you can do that. What that means is your surviving, the surviving spouse and your guardian that you've appointed in your will will have to act together uh, in the interest of the child until um, the child reaches 21 years old. So uh, some of the considerations, I mean, the legal, the legal aspect is that the guardian has to act jointly with the surviving spouse. So you must always, uh, Take care firstly to make sure you appoint someone who is ready, uh, willing to act as a guardian because it is a big responsibility and you have to make sure that that person actually gets along well with your child 
uh, and also that that person, I mean, in the event that you predecease your spouse, that person will be able to work together with your spouse uh, for the you know care and welfare of the child. Um, so yeah, these are the things that you have to uh, consider about that, that. You know, the guardian and the parent will have to act jointly in the interest of the child. Yes. Okay. Thank you for that. So we're going to move on to the Q and A because I see quite a few different questions flooding in. Um, so let me just start with what I think is one of the more interesting ones I see here. Um, I guess it, it could be for the both of you, maybe Marcus, if you want to just lead. Um, in the current COVID situation, where meeting face to face can be a challenge, can a will be signed electronically and witnesses be present virtually? So in Singapore, the answer is no. They, they ha there's no amendment to the law as yet to allow remote witnessing of wills. Um, uh, so, so you know, despite the COVID situation, we still have to um, comply with the the, the requirements that um, uh, Radhika set out. Mm -hmm. um, in other countries, the US and the UK, for example, they have been a little bit more. Um, uh, um, uh, forward on this issue, and it is possible to have um, uh, electronic witnessing, for example, so vi witnessing by video, for example, um, but but not so far in Singapore. Okay, so Radhika, do you ever think that the Singapore legal system is just like in talks at the moment? Are they potentially, I mean, I know I'm asking you a question that should be raised in parliament, but... Um, <laughs> yeah, nothing any... at the moment, I mean, they are the only the only concern now is about get doing meetings under the company's act, etc. Nobody has actually thought about making amendments to uh, electronically witness the signing of a will because you know these are very sensitive documents uh, and wills are routinely challenged when the estate is big enough. So I think there's a bit of hesitance in amending the law in this area. Okay, um, I mean, so even in that sense, if what do you do for clients who are Singapore residents? But say, for instance, currently stuck outside, is there a way for you to go ahead and write a will for them in Singapore? If they are residents of Singapore, but they are stuck overseas, that is that what you are yep. saying? Yep. We can always prepare the will for them. It's just that when we send it to them for the signing, for the purposes of the signing, they're going to have to go and look for two socially distanced witnesses to you know, uh, witness the signing. Of course, as long as you comply with the requirements that these witnesses are not beneficiaries or spouses of these beneficiaries, then the, the will is, the witnesses are fine. It's in order. Okay, thank you for that. Um, we've got uh, one of our participants requesting to speak, um, a King Go. Is that possible for us to put him on? Okay, I think maybe not yet, if we can come back to that shortly. Um, I've got another question here coming to from Sophie. So how would a guardian who is based in the UK be able to come into Singapore to take the minor child back to the UK with them um, within 30 days of, say, a husband and wife becoming deceased? So what happens to the child? Okay, uh, what we normally do in uh, for these kind of situations for expat clients is we do a temporary uh, guardianship kind of clause. What that does is to state that, you know, if, if both parents uh, pass away within 30 days of each other, then there will be a temporary guardian appointed uh, whilst any family member is coming from uh, overseas. There will be uh, someone who's here, who, who lives here, who's resident here in Singapore, who will take care of the, the child until that uh, permanent testamentary guardian comes uh, to Singapore. And once that's done, is basically it's just a, a statement of the testator's intention to that this person be appointed as the guardian of the child. So it's actually a pretty straightforward process unless someone else comes in and says, hey, I want to challenge this because I think this person who was appointed in the will is not fit to be the guardian of the child. But barring that, everything just goes as per normal. Okay. And she has a follow-up question as well. So does that mean that the Interstate Succession Act um, apply to your assets that are located in the UK if you live in Singapore. So if you passed away in Singapore without a will, um, will the assets that are located in the UK be distributed according to that slide that we looked at earlier? 
ordinarily yes yes um it should be about the same i mean i can't really advise on uk law as i'm not uh, we're not qualified to practice uk law but being a common uh, law jurisdiction the same sort of rules of distribution would normally apply okay because it's based off uk law essentially yes. singapore's probate act okay um and marcus this question i think more suited for you if i have uk assets um could you share a bit more on what would be the tax implications um so uh, uh i'm well i'm not a uk tax lawyer as you can tell by my accent um but uh, <laughs> um but certainly from 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 uh my perspective of drafting wills which include uk wills um uh, the the the, fir the first and most obvious point is that inheritance tax applies um, uh, for a UK domiciled individual. So even if you're living here in Singapore, um, if you are domiciled in the UK, inheritance tax will apply to your worldwide estate. Um, if you are um, uh, not domiciled in the UK, but you have UK assets, um, then IHT will apply to those UK assets. Um, there are certain exemptions. So, for example, I mentioned earlier that the benefit of a will, for example, there's a spousal exemption. Um, well, let's st step back a bit. First of all, there's a, there's a, the IHT applies on over £325,000. So, if your estate is less than that, then you won't have an IHT problem. But, um, you know, for, for, for the majority, you'll end up you know, with more than three hundred and twenty-five thousand pounds, therefore you'll have to consider the point. Um, uh, there is a spousal exemption, um, so if you give all of your assets to your spouse, then there is no IHT on the passing. Um, uh, one of the interesting things, though, if you died intestate and you died with, say, a spouse and children surviving, um, your spouse will not receive all of the all of your assets. I think the I think the number is uh, the spouse receives two hundred and fifty thousand pounds, and then the rest of it is divided half half with the spouse and the child. So that would mean that potentially there is some IHT exposure there. Um, uh, but that's that. I mean, that's that's the essence of the IHT point. Yeah, it's a worldwide assets basically, so we can't run away from mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we've got Kingo again, who's raised his hand and would like to ask us a question. So if I could just ask you to unmute yourself, please, because you should be able to speak now. Hello, Kingo, can you hear us? Yeah, I think it might be that his mic is not activated. So apologies, um, fellow panelists. Um, now, just one last question before we move on to the case study. Um, I guess this could again be for both of you, but maybe Radhika, if you want to start um, the answer first. I am Singaporean, but I plan to relocate overseas for the next 10 years. Now, what can I do to plan ahead in terms of like selecting, um, setting up my will and also selecting an executor in the event that something happens to me while I'm abroad? Okay, um, it's a good question. Uh, I will answer it on the assumption that most of the assets are located in Singapore. So the very first thing you do is really think about making your will. Uh, what assets, how do you want to distribute your assets if in the event that something happens? Very important is the consideration of who is going to be your executor. So if you have a big, uh, if you have quite a lot of estate, uh, assets and you anticipate that, you know, there might be a bit of work involved, sometimes it's best to appoint two executors okay but um, you you can just go with one that'll be fine uh, it's always best to check with your executor if they are willing to act because you don't want a situation where you try to you just name that person as your executor and then they don't want to take up the act they don't want to take up the responsibility because it is quite a bit of work and they say you know i don't want to do this then you have to go back to the grant of letters of administration process with will and next so always talk to them, talk to your executor first, and always try to maintain a list of your assets um, together with your will. It's not compulsory that you have a list of assets with your will, but it's very, very good practice to keep together with your will a list of all assets that you have so you can update it periodically, you know, when you acquire new assets, etc., so that you help your executor in the event of something happening. 
And of course, if you have any uh, young children, then you're going to have to think about uh, guardianship for, for them, you know, in the event of your passing. That's basically what you need to look out for from me. So okay, I'll probably and, just add to that. Yep, Marcus. Add, add to that as well is is um, uh, um, for for the for, for that question. It doesn't have to be complicated. So you could have you're Singaporean. You can have a worldwide will um, written in Singapore. Singapore can be you know the executors can be here in Singapore, and the worldwide uh, worldwide will will cover your worldwide estate. So if you go and live somewhere for for a period of time. But your domicile, i.e. where you consider to be home and at your permanent home, is still Singapore, um, then Singapore law will still apply to um, all of your movable property. The only time where you need to start considering, oh, should I have more than one will, is if you start buying real estate in other countries, particularly if it's real estate in um, uh, um, uh, civil law countries or I, I guess the the non sort of core Commonwealth or what used to be Commonwealth countries so um, the reason I say that is because you need you need the will if it's a worldwide will you need it to be valid in all of the countries that probate is then going to be obtained in um, and generally speaking if it was a Commonwealth country came from came from the UK tradition the the, the will will typically be valid um, for the for the reasons that Radhika pointed out, how a will is signed. Where it gets a bit more complicated is if you start, you know, if if you buy a property in Poland or something, or or some some European country or or, or Thailand or something like that, where the law isn't necessarily the same um, as it relates to wills. So, so generally speaking, a worldwide will is fine. If you start buying real estate, then you need to start considering: Do I need more than one will? Um, um, although the other factor, um, which is really a nicety, I suppose, is that as, as Radhika said, there, in every country that you have assets, you need probate. So um, uh, you can imagine that if you build up assets in multiple countries, um, uh, which expats, for example, tend to do, the executives are going to have to go from country to country getting probate or resealing a grant of probate, which is going to take some time. Um, so just just be aware of that. But you know it doesn't have to be complicated. Start off with a worldwide will based in Singapore. Okay. So this is actually a follow up question from earlier. Um, so just to be clear, if the will states that I give the whole of my estate to, that that would cover assets in Singapore as well as globally. Is that roughly the right understanding? Correct. Okay. Okay, and one other, I think, quite a good question as well from Sophie. So, do executors need to be based in Singapore, or could it be based in the UK or outside of Singapore, just because you're a Singapore resident? So, I think we touched on this briefly earlier, Marcus. Where it's it's a yes, they can be based. Yeah, you anywhere. can have, you can have your executors wherever you want. I mean, um, as mentioned in my really early example, my friend died in Hong Kong. I I wasn't the executor, but his parents were the executors. He, they lived in New Zealand. Um, you know, I've I've plenty of clients who appoint initially their spouse who might be living in Singapore, but then by default, if that one you know can't do it, um, their sister who might live in Bristol or something like that. Okay. Uh, okay. Just just one and thing to add. Uh, um, if you are going to obtain probate here in Singapore for a will that's executed here, it's I mean, of course, you can select whoever you want as your executor, but it's always best to select an executor that's based in the jurisdiction where you will be applying for probate, simply because um, uh, in terms of execution of documents, it's a lot faster, it's a lot simpler. It also is cheaper if your executor is based overseas, then all the documents will have to be signed before a notary public. Uh, anybody who's dealt with notaries public will know how expensive they are, uh, a lot more expensive than signing your documents before a commissioner for oaths. So um, we've had a, we had a case before where it was a grant of probate. It was supposed to be a lot, a very simple, straightforward matter, but it took a lot longer because the executor was based in the United States. And it did take some time for him to get the documents to us. And then sometimes there will be some error in the signing. Then it had to be done again. So that whole process, which was actually supposed to be done within, say, two months, it ended up taking six months. So sometimes it's best to have the executor based uh, in Singapore. That's just a practical consideration. Okay, and I guess you both would agree as well. So on the same thing, and just uh, 
in the necessity to save as much time as possible. Again, having different wills in each jurisdiction, because then you can immediately at the same time apply for probate everywhere. That will essentially reduce your overall how long it's going to take you before you get access to the deceased estate, right? Yes, generally. Um, the, the the thing is, I mean, if you if you there's there's two different situations. One is you do a worldwide uh, will, like like what Marcus mentioned, and that covers everything. What that means is, when the person passes away, you're going to have to apply for probate in Singapore. Wait until that process is ended, and then once you get that grant of probate, then you go to the other jurisdictions and you go through a process called resealing. Some countries, in some places, it costs more to do resealing. In some places, it doesn't. So um, what it does is it will most certainly extend the period for you to finish ex uh, administering the estate because you're going to wait for the probate first in Singapore, and then you're going to have to go to the other jurisdictions and apply to court for the resealing. So you will need the original grant with you for each application. So that's going to take a, uh, that's going to take some time, as opposed to when you have separate wills covering separate jurisdictions. This is also not something that we will recommend for everybody. It all depends on your needs. Not everybody needs a will in every jurisdiction that they have an asset in, because you know it's going to cost you money as well when you go and apply for probate in those various countries. So if you've got a bank account with say five hundred pounds in it. It's not going to be worth doing a, a will for that. So it's a matter of, you know, making the right considerations. Anything to add, Marcus? Because we're going to be moving on to the case study after this. Uh, no, I think so. I, th I think um, Radhika um, explained it well. In the meantime, we do have some questions coming in. Okay, so... This one's quite a good one, and I'm not sure whether either Marcus or Radhika would have uh, any experience with dealing with this, but my family and I are Singaporean. My father is currently very ill. Now, he has expressed intention to update his will, but he has not gotten around to doing it. So does the will have to be done officially for it to be valid? And what would happen, so it's a two-pronged question, but what would happen if he passed away before making changes to his will? Can family members who stand to gain by the amendment make a case? I think I'll take the first part of the question about whether a will needs to be done officially. Um, short answer is no, because uh, I mean, you can even write your will down on a piece of paper as long as you comply with the five requirements that we mentioned at the start of the, this session, uh, that it has to be in writing, the testator is over 21, signed by the witnesses, and those, those, the other two requirements it is valid. There is no need for it to be prepared by a lawyer or any sort of formal documentation that needs to be prepared. Just as long as it meets these criteria under the Wills Act. Okay. And Marcus, do you have any input on the second point? So what if he did pass away without making changes to the will? Can the family members who are supposed to gain kind of make um, the case? Yeah. I mean, very very difficult for the um the family members to make any case um of course they could go back and the most likely option for the family is to go back and um charge that the will wasn't effect wasn't made uh correctly so um and, and often you might see arguments of perhaps duress or you know that 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 um, he was forced to to, to make changes um, I mean, interestingly, when, when you know when, when you're at law school, you sort of see this this the, these cases of deathbed gifts, um, and you know it very rarely arises. Um, but I do have one, or I did have one uh, earlier last year, um, of this of, of a similar kind of situation where um, uh, a, you know an, um, uh, a father um, had a had a will written. Um, uh, for most of his life, it was the same. Um, but then, what he had done was that he. This was a, this was a, um, a Singaporean family, um, and um, he had excluded um, one or two of his children from benefiting under the will. And those children lived in the family home along with other beneficiaries um, of the will. And um, uh, he had said just before he died that oh he's decided that he should make up with those 
children who are excluded, and I think that those and he thinks that those children should be included in the will. Um, and so, you know, there was a claim to say, well, you know, the the will got got changed on his deathbed, um, even though there wasn't any formal change. And what was clear from the case was how difficult it is for anyone to mount an argument to say that the will should not be enforced as written. Um, so um, these deathbed gifts, for example, if you if you verbally just say, oh, look, I, I've decided I don't like what I'd written, I want something else, is very difficult to prove. And um, most of the time they sort of get, they, they, they get pushed away. So um, the, the, the simple answer, you know, in, in this kind of scenario would be that the, that the original will would probably stand unless it was an obvious case of duress or something. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus and Radhika. So um, just to follow on from a question from earlier, actually. So this is a, a same Adams asking us if the two witnesses have passed away or have lost contact with them, should you get a new will witness? Is that necessary? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. The only reason why you need the witnesses is in case someone challenges your will uh, when you pass away. So if you've ex ex executed a will and the witnesses have passed away, you want to protect the integrity of your will upon your demise, then do a new one with new witnesses, because otherwise who's going to be able to contact the deceased witnesses to confirm what they saw? So it's, yeah, you've got to do a new will. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And finally, I mean, as a wrap that's, that's quite an interesting. Sorry, I'll 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 add to that. That's quite an interesting point there. Um, the there is a practice, um, uh, and um, and we follow this practice at Hawksford that we 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 um, uh, ask our um, uh, witnesses to provide an affidavit um, of a testing witness. So that's a document sworn um, that that provides that. You know that the witnesses witnessed the person's signature that that he was you know um, not under duress that it was lawful etc cetera, etc cetera, as to the best of their knowledge. So that might address uh, Radhika's point about if if they died, at least you have a a, a, a sworn document under oath um, by way of this affidavit of a testing witness. So does that get done at the same time, Marcus, as the will is being set up? So while mm, the witness, yeah, we. Yeah, yeah. I mean, generally speaking, if 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 Hawksford are, to, uh, are involved in the will, we'll, we'll probably um, uh, our our um, uh, um, trust administrators will probably be the witnesses. So we will provide a, a an affidavit as well. Okay. And before we wrap up, because we're just about on time, um, what would be a final piece of advice or final thoughts that each of you would have for our audience here? I think I'll let Marcus go first. Oh, okay. Um, uh, so for me, I think um, uh, the, the the key questions that I would always ask are: um, Do you need a will in the first place? Think about um, the complexity of your estate. Think about your children, um, uh, and think about: Do you want to give in a different direction to what the intestacy law would be? Um, if you're living outside your home country. Probably you do, you should do a will because of the added complexity of that. Um, there's going to be the question of where are you domiciled because where you're domiciled will govern the law of any um, uh, movable property. So that's property that's not real estate. Um, uh, and for real estate, the law of the country where that real estate is situated governs that. So that leads on to the question: Do I need one will or two? And Radhika, any okay. final thought? I think just a few points to add on to what Marcus just said. I think we we touched on the executors and guardians. It's really very, very important. I mean, once you've decided to go ahead and do a will, and if you have children, uh, you have to give some real thought as to how your guardians, I mean, who you're going to appoint as your guardians, your executors. They must be willing and able to act because ordinarily for an executor, you they don't get to claim a commission on the estate. You don't get paid uh, as of right to administer an estate. I mean, if you want to get some payment, you will have to apply to court. And the court will decide depending on how big the estate is. So if it's a small estate, it's really a thankless job. Uh, you you got to make sure whoever it is you're selecting is, is really 
okay with taking up that responsibility. Also, take note of what assets that you can't uh, include in your will. For example, CPF monies, those cannot be willed away. You'll have to do a separate nomination with the CPF board, uh, you know, state where your CPF monies go to. And if you don't make a nomination or if you try to will away your CPF monies in your, in your last will and testament, uh, you'll be considered as, you know, there's been nobody named to take the CPF monies and it'll be distributed again in accordance with the intestacy laws that we just, you know, the, the act that we just went through earlier. Um, apart from that, another thing to think about is um, the insurance policies. Some insurance policies, you can make the nomination for your beneficiaries. If you have that option, do that because that takes the insurance policies out of your assets that are going to be distributed by the executors. So you're giving your executor less work, I mean, as well, because if there's been a nomination made for your insurance policy, all that's needed is to prove the death of the insured and the insurance uh, the insurance firm will just pay out according to what the nomination state the states so it's a lot more straightforward that way um yeah uh, these are things to think about also you might want to consider um, appointing replacement or substitute beneficiaries in your will in the event that you know the person the, your original beneficiary does not survive you by 30 days um, so you might want to have backups in case you know your original beneficiary does not does not survive you um, that's about it, really. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Radhika, and thank you, Marcus, um, for joining us this evening. Now, I'm just going to close with a poll because we'd be happy to get in touch to discuss more. Um, but do share with us through this poll what area that you'd be interested in. So just going to give it a few minutes, uh, what areas that you would need guidance on. Just a few more seconds so everyone has a chance to vote. Okay, if we can close the poll now, please. Okay, so moving on just a little bit about the Heritage Partnership. So we're a partner practice of St. James's Place um, Private Limited, which is a FTSE 100 company. Um, now, what it is, is that essentially we bring together a team of us and we want to be personal in our approach. We want to be proactive in what we do, strong and principled, as well as to bring prosperity to our community. And St. James's Place itself, so we're a FTSE 100 company. Um, we've got about 700,000 760,000 of clients globally, and we currently manage about Singapore dollars, 235 billion. Now, in Asia, we've got offices in Hong Kong, Singapore, and China, and of course, headquartered in the UK. Now, we've also got a St. James's Place Charitable Foundation, and right now, we've actually got a virtual fundraising, virtual mission for the St. James's Place Charitable Foundation, there's a QR code on screen in front of you. It would be great if you could just learn a little bit more about our initiative. Our upcoming event will be on the 8th of April. And this is, again, I guess, a similar sort of topic, but it's securing your family's financial future. So the fundamentals of estate protection and education planning. Now, we've got our guest on this webinar would actually be Aviva, who will be covering off protection, one of our associate partners at the Heritage Partnership, Alex, will be covering off education planning. And our own St. James's Place Tax and Technical, Jasmine E, will be covering off fundamentals of estate. Thank you all for spending your evening with us. Um, thank you, Marcus. Thank you, Radhika. If you do have any inquiries, please do let us know. I wish you all a good evening. Thank you all.